This conference will now be recorded. I'd like to welcome you in the third of our series of educational seminars on networking for security applications. In seminar one, uh, it was an overview. Seminar two, we focused on POE. And today we're going to take a detailed look into network switches. Network switches control both bandwidth and POE. And while all network components interact with each other to determine the specifications and performance of the network, the network switch is one of the most important components within that chain. We'd like to uh, just remind you that uh, regardless of viewing and recording specifications, they're all dependent upon every component within the network for quality and reliability. And regardless of whether you're in sales, design, installation, technical support, everybody plays an important role in assuring the most reliable security performance and the most reliable systems to reduce potential problems. And with that, we'll start our seminar. So today we're going to look at network switch specifications, packet size limitations and their effect on performance, network switch fabric limitations, POE standards and issues, specification confusion, and in this seminar we're going to focus on some special features that are included in Vigitron switches. So let's talk about the general network performance. Basically, when we discuss networking, and we discuss how to judge performance within a network, it is tied to something called RFC 2544. RFC 2544 judges the performance of network products between 64 bytes and 15, 18 bytes. The problem that we face is we really don't know when a product is being specified as to what packet size is being used to judge its performance. In most cases, it's going to be 64 bytes because the lower the packet size, the better the performance. And here again, in general, we're only dealing with Excel files and Word documents, not larger video files. So this specification could be a little bit misleading when we apply our larger video files. For example, a one to two megapixel camera may fall in the range of RFC 2544. But as we increase in size and megapixel ability, we get into the range of jumbo products. And jumbo frames and packets are completely different. They can go up to 10K, and now some of them are even being specified at 14K, depending upon the product itself. So let's say a 33 megapixel camera would definitely fall in the range of jumbo packets. But here again, the product you're looking for has been specified at 64 bytes, something that doesn't apply whatsoever. So bandwidth and performance of both PoE are generally judged by IEEE specifications. What is the packet size limitation and how does it affect your performance within a network designed for security applications? Well, virtually every single product that we have in the security product environment, whether we talk about cameras, access control, lighting, wireless, et cetera, will output at a range of about 100 megabps. Network switches in general, due to their design, when they are run in the auto mode, they are locked into receiving that signal and adjusting it so it's compatible with the input signal, 100 megabps. At that point, however, it cannot resolve anything over 15, 18 bytes. That is its packet limitation. Now, you may be wondering, why is it that whenever I read a specification for a network switch, it says jumbo frames? And that's because it does resolve jumbo frames in the 1G mode. However, you cannot run networking asynchronously. So even if you were to fix a port of a switch to 1G, and the input was 100 megabps, it would run asynchronously and it would drop packets. Therefore, whenever you plug in a camera, an access control, LED lighting, or anything else, you're generally running at 100 megabps and you're generally limited to 15, 18 bytes. This is the problem we face about the difficulties involved in using standard types of equipment that were not meant to handle the signal capacity of larger packet sizes. 
So what's the problem? What do we see when that occurs? Well, that really depends on the size of the packet that's entering the port of the switch. The larger the packet size, the more to the distortion. In this slide, we see that basically the problem is pixelization. The higher the packet size, the more the pixelization problem occurs. So once again, keep in mind uh, of the problems related for network switches when it comes to resolving packet sizes and the fact that most of them, if not all of them, are tested at 64 bytes. So let's talk about a secondary limitation, and that is even more critical to the system. Quite often, we'll get a call that says, I was able to see my camera about a half an hour ago, but now it's disappeared. Suddenly, it reappeared again. And of course, this affects the recording as well as the viewing. This is a function of what we call the switch fabric. A network switch, even in its standalone capacity, is virtually its own network. In order to pass video, it must have two times the sum of the highest bandwidth of all the ports. Let me repeat that because that is very important. The bandwidth internally within a switch to, to pass all video must have two times the sum of the highest bandwidth of all the ports. This is dependent upon what we call the switch fabric. And it's very akin to, let's say, a highway. Let's make this analogy. I get on the highway and I'm cruising along at 75 miles an hour and there is no problem. Now all of a sudden more cars come on the highway and I have to continually slow down. Now I'm stuck in a traffic jam. And basically in that traffic jam, the exit I have to get off on is probably about a mile down the road, but I can't get off, I'm stuck. This is exactly the way a video security network works. The NVR or the VMS system will call out to the camera and say, it's time for me to record you, send me the signal. It's time for somebody to see the camera, send me the signal. But if it's stuck on that highway, it can't respond. The reason it's intermittent is because the bandwidth demands of calling the other cars who might want to get on or off are also intermittent. And this is why we may see the camera or record it at certain times and not at others. This is one of the most common problems because the switch fabric quality is totally dependent on the construction of the switch itself. Lesser expensive switches have less bandwidth within their switch fabric and are more prone to losing a camera on its highway than more expensive switches. Let's put this now basically in a regular security format. Camera A enters at a time when the switch fabric is available and it passes it on to the uplink or to another port. We're fine. Camera B enters at a time when the switch fabric is not available and does not pass up to the uplink. It's blocked and can't be seen. Situation again can change at any given time. Let's talk about PoE standards. We covered this in our last session. So once again, just to make sure that we know what our terminology is, in terms of the 802.3 standard, the PSE, the power source equipment, is where the PoE originates from. It transmits its PoE to the PD, the power device. In this case, we'll call it the camera. The current flows from the PSE to the camera, the PD at the established levels, were fine. But if it exceeds those levels or doesn't respond to those levels in a certain period of time, the system will shut down. This is called the PD signature. Basically, these are the standards that are built into IEEE PoE that are built in two switches in order to comply with safety. It prevents products from burning up due to shorts. Injectors are not compliant to IEEE standards. So in fact, if you see a device that is called an injector or has injector capabilities, 
I would very much suggest avoiding it because you need those standards for the safety and the protection of your equipment. But we face a problem in this. So let's start at the beginning. I just said that in order to operate correctly, the POE that's provided by the PSE to the PD must be the right amount and must be provided within a certain period of time. Again, the things that we covered in the previous seminar. Why then, after we've established normal operation, is the biggest complaint that we get involved with are the cameras continuing to shut down. And that's because of something we call the surge element. After the proper power is established between the PD and the PSE, there are possibilities that during the course of operation, we could have a surge. And that surge would be due, let's say, to what we call accessory features, day-night operation, LED operation, PTZ. And in physics, for any device, it takes more power to establish an operation than it does to operate itself. So when we switch on day-night, when we switch on IR, LEDs, etc., there is a surge that occurs, a rush of power. The switch must be able to provide that extra power to the camera in order to keep it operational. Now, within the standard, if it does shut down, it stays down, assuming that the rush was occurred by a short and it doesn't want to start up again by itself fearing that it may in fact damage the connected equipment. This is the normal operation. But what occurs as a result of it is an installer going out, setting up an IP POE system, everything works fine, and the customer comes in uh, during the next morning and two or three cameras are offline. Thinking that the cameras themselves are defective, they get returned to the manufacturer, only to have the manufacturer say nothing's wrong, and then you get this back and forth type of condition. So understand that within the IEEE standards that dictate POE within a switch environment, when that surge occurs, there is a shutdown of power. Within networks and within network switching, there is specification confusion. Now we touched on this at the beginning of the seminar when we talked about packet size and how basically regular switches, what we call standard switches, were really specified at 64 bytes and have nothing to do with the frame size, the packet size that we require for our video applications. So some of the questions that we're going to be covering these in within specification confusions are, what's the difference between switch power supply and PoE budget? Why is that important? If a switch provides only total power, how do I calculate what the PoE budget is? Most switches claim they handle jumbo frames, do they? We covered that. My switch spec indicates it provides 30 watts PoE per port, but does it? So let's look into these areas in more detail. The first and important is the difference between total power and PoE budget. Many network switches will only provide you with one figure for the total power. That does not represent what the POE budget is, POE budget being defined as the actual power that's available to drive your cameras. And that's because the switch itself requires some power. But there's also another problem. Network switches, common network switches, were never designed to have all their ports loaded to the maximum capacity of their POE power. As power increases internally, in this little 1U high switch, heat increases. And therefore, constantly running these switches at their total power results in sort of a convection oven. <clears throat> this dries out components, limits the life of the switch, and in some cases could even catch on fire. So there needs to be some safety elements brought into effect as far as what the differences are between total power in the switch, and your POE budget. So in general, that figure will come out to be about 25%. Illustrating a point, if the total switch power was 100 watts, your POE budget, for safety reasons, 
should be about 75 watts. Again, you want to avoid turning your switch into a convection oven. It is a very, very critical element. So the question we get a lot is within the switch is how much PoE power do I really have? And quite often, the specification itself could be a little bit misleading into thinking that you have more power than you have. So when somebody calls up and um, we ask the question and we say, how much PoE power do you have at the port? They go 30 watts. And we go, well, why? Well, the specification says 30 watts. And we go, really? So um, what is your switch read? Well, it's, what's the total power? Well, it's 400 watts. Okay, well, did you take into account your separation of power for safety reasons or what's really available for your PoE? Uh, no. Okay, let's use that figure. Let's take 75%. So now we're down to 300 watts. How many ports does your switch have? Well, it has 24. Okay, so now we're going to take 24 and divide it into 300, and we find out that if all ports are operational and require PoE at the same time, the maximum amount of power per port is only 12.5 watts. This is a critical calculation that you need to do in order to determine if the switch that you're purchasing does have the adequate PoE power for your connected devices. It's not that the specifications are wrong, but they can be misleading. This happens to be a specification of a typical switch. And when we read the specification, we might easily determine that all ports provide 15.4 watts at the same time, the full capacity of 802.3 AF. But as we go down the list itself, we find out that there are differences here. If we use the formula and apply the 25%, what happens is we find out that when all ports are operational, they really revert to 6.49 watts or class two. So again, be very careful in reading your specifications in great detail and determining the actual power that's used. And again, if a single, if a single specification is used for power, please reduce that by at least 25% to calculate your POE budget. Another terminology that's confusing in switches is called layering. Let's start with one simple premise. There is no specification for layering in network switches. The term layer when applied to networking is an internet term only to define the different layers within the internet, okay, or with an IP. Layering then applied to switches is a made up term and it generally can apply to anything that the manufacturer wants to apply it to. Throughout the years, there has been a definition that has been taken into account for what we call layer three. <clears throat> and layer three basically defines everything within a switch, including dynamic routing. Now, what is dynamic routing? It's a way of crossing different networks. Very simply applied, Dynamic routing is used if you Google. If you Google and you ask Google a question, it will go out to servers throughout all around the world through different, different network paths. And somehow it knows to come back to you and give you that answer. Well, that's a distinct deficit when it comes to security because routing can be easily hacked. And the last thing we want within our systems is for it to be hacked. Layer two plus has basically taken on the definition of, uh, of very simply everything that layer three offers except routing. But there's a new terminology that's been applied lately and that terminology is called layer three light. And what layer three light defines is routing but using fixed IP addresses. So when we use layer three light, we're basically using the switch to communicate to other networks and other components that are attached to that particular port. They might be multiple switches, for example. But it's more difficult to hack a layer three light configuration because you have to know the specific 
IP addresses of the connected devices. The most important thing is when you're looking at a switch specification and it defines layering, especially in the area of layer two plus, it could be anything that the manufacturer determines that it wants to be. So, how should we consider it? Number one, why do you want a layer, a layer three switch? Sometimes we hear the definition or an answer that says, well, three is better than two. In reality, a full layer three switch with built-in routing is actually a deficit to your security application and an open door for people to hack the switch itself. Where again, layer three light provides the protection of having fixed IP addresses. So let's look at some of the special features involved with Vigitron switches. I bring this up because um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Vigitron, we design products based on interoperational testing. And interoperational testing gives us the ability of finding out where the holes are, what are the needs of a network that has to perform specifically for security operations and incorporate those features. Well, we spoke first about jumbo frames. In the Vigitron switch line, we can program up to 9,600, in some cases 14K, jumbo frames, even at 100 megabps. And that eliminates the problem that we first saw with pixelization. All Vigitron switches have a minimum, an absolute minimum of at least two times the sum of the highest bandwidth of each of the ports. So that takes care of the switch fabric consideration. Also on startup, Vigitron switches will test the line multiple times. So instead of just connecting once and saying, well, I didn't connect or well, the PD demanded more power than I have. I'm going to try again just to make sure it wasn't a fluke. I also have the ability within Vigitron switches to protect it. And let me explain what I mean. Uh, I'll use an example that actually led to the development of this feature. Uh, there was a school district down in Florida that had several buildings that had more than 50% of their cameras were PTZ. And when the power dropped out and restarted again, on that restart, the surge was so great it was burning up the switch itself. In the Vigitron switches, you can delay the PoE power so that those heavier draw items can be started up as much as five minutes, a duration of five minutes after the start of the regular PoE at any time frame that you want. And therefore, you get a nice even application of PoE power protecting the switch. The next is probably one of the most important features. We spoke about surges before. And we gave the example of that install installation, which worked properly when it was first installed during the day. And when the owner came in the next day, two or three cameras were offline because of the surges that occurred due to uh, those accessory features like day, night, startup, auto back focus, et cetera. Well, in Vigitron switches, you can program in the specific IP address of the connected device into the port of the switch, and it will continue to monitor its connection. Should the monitor drop out, it will first reapply PoE, because the camera has to be in the on condition, and then reconnect resulting in minimal downtime, eliminating the need for a service call, and protecting the whole system. This is a very, very critical feature of automatic restart. In a lot of ways also, it also adds a security element. If somebody would try to plug in a different camera in the port for some reason, and the, P and the IP address was assigned to that port, it simply would not operate. So it adds a level of security on top of the ability of its protection and maintaining operation. At Vigitron, we strive to constantly improve our products or make them simpler to operate while continuing to test and verify the operations of the network itself. 
So we have additional features in some of our later designs. I'll explain what intelligent power limit is. Normally, when you look at a PoE switch, you can program that switch for a specific amount of power or class power. And that either defines the source of it itself, like the source has to be a class two, class three, class four, or a specific amount of power that it has to generate in order to meet the requirements of the connected device. But what happens if we don't know about the cabling itself? What happens if there's more resistance in the cable that we haven't accounted for? What happens if we're using things like extenders or repeaters or other devices that, in, that in, as part of their normal operation also increase the amount of resistance within the line, period? So intelligent power limit automatically calculates the amount of this resistance and adjusts the amount of power from the source to be provided to the connected device. In a way, it's an automatic setup for PoE. We also spoke about surges before, and we said that in order to overcome surges, we have to have a certain amount of power, that figure being about 20%, which is what we've calculated through our investigations throughout the year. Well, what happens when you're already at the maximum of 30 watts power for 802.3 AT? The limit with CAD5 cabling is about 36 to 37 watts. So in Vigitron switches, we increase the port power to 36 watts so that when these surges occur, the surge power is available at the port itself and is easily applied in order to maintain operation. Let's take another quick look at auto restart and why it's so important and how all of these things work together. So we start with the connection. We now have the camera. We've taken it out of the box. It's in the off position. We've programmed the PoE power to the port of the switch. It's, of course, not generating any power because we don't have a connection. And now we make the connection using the Ethernet cable. Well, the first thing is we generate the power based on the resistance of the cable using intelligent power limit. But now another thing comes into play. What if there is a big surge? How do we know whether that surge is due to a short or it's due just to the startup? Well, we have another feature within Vigitron switches called Transit Protect. And Transit Protect will automatically determine that condition. It'll know whether it's a short or whether it's a surge. And if it's a surge, it'll reach into the bank of the port we have those extra six watts and provide it in order to overcome the surge element. If it's a short, it will shut down the port as normal operation. Once we make the connection, the PoE check takes over, provided we've put in the IP address of the camera into the port and the constant monitoring continues until if, if for some reason the connection is broken and then the restart will start over again. So. <clears throat> What about security? Okay, let's take a quick look at security features that we have within Vigitron switches. Well, in some cases, network security systems may be tied to the internet for some reason or some outside networks. Of course, what we want to do there is block access to it or port 80 access. We have the ability of doing it. Another problem we face is the difference between TCP and UDP filtering. Most cameras work on UDP. In other words, it's a straight line of the camera transmitting its video signal to the port of the switch. Network communications, especially Ethernet conditions, operate basically using TCP. And that's what makes it hackable. So if we eliminate the ability of the port responding to TCP and limit it to UDP, basically we've cut down on the chance of it being hacked. MAC address binding is something that you'll find in most switches, and that is the ability of putting the MAC address 
which we consider to be the, the serial number. Every single network device has its own individual MAC address. And we can put those MAC addresses that we want connected into the port of the switch. If somebody tries to replace it with another item that does not have that MAC address, and remember it's unique to every product, it simply will not respond. But over the years, people have become smart. And they've been able to affect a process called ghosting, where they ghost or emulate not only the IP address, but the MAC address itself. So Vigitron has added a very unique feature to this, which is called Secure Port. And if somebody tries to ghost it, even though they've properly emulated the MAC address from the device that they've disconnected, it will shut down the port and issue an alert. I want to remind you that Vigitron has a complete design center service team. Every single network that you have, every one of your network needs is totally unique. It's unique based on all the individual components that make up the network. It's unique because of the wiring involved. All of these things come into play as to why network design cannot be the property of a computer program or a drop-down menu. And because for over 10 years, Vigitron has based its designs on the investigation of leading manufacturers' products in the area of cameras, access control, LED lighting, wireless products. We have a very, very good library and database of how all of these products work and their uniqueness. They them in themselves have unique designs that require unique solutions. And we have a team of engineers called the Design Center team that will help you in the design and build a bill of materials for you specific to your application. It doesn't matter what the size of your project is, big or small. And we provide this service free and without any obligation. Why can we do it? Because Vigitron is the only manufacturer that offers families of products, over 250, in every single category of networks. So we can put together complete network designs, in many cases even offering more than one particular design and explaining the differences, but never less than reliability. Our, this is important because by getting your products from one source, you avoid the finger pointing that normally and the blame that's put on manufacturers or between manufacturers of different network components. Our products are designed, tested, and quality controlled in the United States with local support from engineers that you can access. We have the industry's longest warranty, which is production lifetime plus three years, meaning that even after three years, even after your product goes end of life, you still have a complete three-year warranty. So we thank you for taking the time to view this seminar. We invite you to address any questions you have, design center support, or questions on anything to support at Vigitron.com. You can also send them to my attention, Neil Heller. My information is there. We hope you'll continue to review these seminars, and we hope that it's helped you in your efforts.